Um, we've got one more panel today, how to effectuate distressed hospital sales where prior efforts have failed. Um, a very, very topical discussion. I know a lot of people in our world have spent a lot of time, hopefully not in the hospital personally, but uh, in dealing with hospital situations. So I'm going to turn it over to Kevin Eckhart, our moderator today, who will introduce the panelists and we'll get right into the discussion. Kevin? Thanks, Josh. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very interesting subject. Uh, again, I'm uh, Kevin Eckhart, Distressed Debt Legal Analyst at Reorg. Um, of course, we cover high yield, distressed and bankrupt borrowers of all sizes. I hope you're familiar with us. I'll be your humble moderator today. And now our panel of experts, Peter Chadwick of Berkeley Research Group has served as Chief Restructuring Officer, CEO, COO, CFO and advisor for distressed companies. Um, and as advisor to our trustee for liquidating trusts in a variety of industries. Peter has extensive experience in leading restructurings in a number of industries, uh, and most importantly for our purposes, extensive experience in effectuating sale transactions. His debtor experience spans the spectrum from the largest U.S. companies to middle market proprietary companies, including as restructuring advisor to and eventually interim CFO for Verity Health, which will be our case study today. Uh, Tanya Moiran is a partner in Denton's Restructuring, Insolvency, and Bankruptcy Group. Tanya has significant experience in bankruptcy, corporate re restructuring, and litigation, in which she has represented debtors, creditors, and equity committees. She has also advised buyers and sellers of assets in bankruptcy and receivership cases. Tanya represented the debtors in the Verity Health Chapter 11 case. Uh, up next, Jim Maloney. Jim is the co-head of Kane Brothers Health Systems M&A Group and has 29 years of experience in healthcare mergers, acquisitions, financings, and real estate transactions, including representing academic medical centers, not-for-profit health systems, publicly traded and privately owned healthcare providers, and others uh, in these transactions. Jim served as the investment banker for the Verity Health Debtors and led the way in the sale process that we will discuss. Uh, finally, we have Mark Schinderman of Millbank, our self-appointed plucky comic relief. Uh, Mark is a partner at Millbank and has almost 30 years of experience uh, restructuring companies inside and outside of bankruptcy and handling the purchase of assets out of, outside of bankruptcy. Mark represented the Unsecured Creditors Committee in the Verity cases. Um, so what we'll be discussing today is distressed hospital sales using the panel's experience in the recent Verity Health bankruptcy cases in Los Angeles as a case study. Uh, we'll be focusing sort of three key areas and three primary challenges facing estate professionals in these cases. Uh, first, extending the runway for distressed hospitals to survive through the marketing process. Second, efficient bankruptcy processes to maintain and unlock value um, in a sale. And finally, the unique aspects of marketing a distressed hospital business. Uh, we may also, if we have time, discuss a few other sort of difficult to classify issues that are difficult to resolve in these cases. Um, I'll start with Tanya. Tanya, if you could please provide us a brief summary of where the Verity Health uh, debtors were when the case was filed. Sure, happy to do that and uh, thank you. So when the debtors filed, it was August 31st, 2018. The debtors were previously the daughters of charity and had spent decades and decades, unfortunately, operating at a loss. There were a number of factors that contributed to the filing that made it impossible for Verity to continue without a restructuring. If anyone knows the case, there's a long list, but uh, to summarize it, Verity was operating at $450,000 of uh, losses a day. There had been agreements with the unions, CDAs that were above market. There were seismic obligations in the tune of $100 million that were going to need to be paid. There were a host of infrastructure issues that required Verity to invest $100 million dollars and there were five other significant issues that Verity could no longer continue without a restructuring. So we met with Verity. We created, I think, a really great team with BRG and with Kane and developed a plan 
to file and to sell the hospitals to more stable operators. And Verity is a nonprofit. So the mission was to sell these hospitals to stable operators and to protect patient care. And uh, that was how we started and that's how we ended. Thanks, Tanya. I guess, speaking of BRG, we'll turn over to Peter to sort of talk about our first area of focus. And that is making sure the hospital with all of these these challenges um, up to and including preparing for the big one in Los Angeles. Um, Peter, when we talk about extending the runway to get the hospital through the sale process, what does that mean to you? Well, it's, Verity is a, a great business case in point, and, and it's uh, similar to a lot of hospitals that were in that situation, particularly in um, the 2018-2019 period, where it had significant legacy liabilities that had to be um, addressed. It ultimately had an operating model that that no longer was viable. But most importantly, from a timing perspective, it was out of cash. Uh, it And it had no unencumbered assets upon which it could seek additional financing. Uh, and so the fuse had been lit. And um, in order to maximize the um, limited liquidity we had, and then even after filing the, the limited interim liquidity we had, uh, an attempt to make a run for the exits as fast as possible, we really had to find a way to maximize um, the, uh, the, the duration upon which the underlying financing would take us, not just because um, we wanted to have as complete a marketing process, and Jim can talk about the nuances of that and, and how you can rationalize that in a distressed process, but probably more importantly, because with hospital sales, um, in some states are more, some states are, are more uh, egregious than others. In the regulatory approval process, California is probably out there on the far end of that, um, where you Huge needed surprise. to once, once right, <laughs> um, right. Personal commentary aside, the uh, but once you had found a buyer, you know, once Kane had gone through the process of finding a buyer, you actually had to go through the regulatory process of getting that approved. And that's a very long process. Mm -hmm. So when you were first uh, brought in, well, let me ask, when were you first uh, and BRG first brought in to start this process of uh, managing the company's liabilities in order to make it through to the sale? We were brought in in late July 2018. So we had about a month to plan for the bankruptcy. Now, I guess let's talk about the specific areas where you need to do this kind of thing. I mean, first of all, what, what comes to mind for me um, having been involved in some of these situations is the labor costs and how you handle uh, and minimize and rationalize um, those costs at a, a large public hospital. Yeah, bingo. It's um, without a doubt, every hospital, acute care hospital client we have, one of the first things we do is an analysis on the opportunity and labor costs. And, um, and, and without a doubt, every instance, there's some opportunity in labor costs. Now, um, the, I'll break it out in sort of two pieces. There's um, the nursing staffing, right? That's going to be your largest cost center for labor costs. And um, that can be a very complicated analysis, not just because, you know, looking at um, utilization versus um, the potential uh, paid hours, but because there are either collective bargaining agreement limitations um, or there's regulatory limitations. So collective bargaining limitations could be um, bumping rights. You could have guaranteed hours where um, even when you um, put people um, or sketch people off or um, try and do a reduction in the number of staff, you'll have guaranteed hours that you still have to pay. So you begin to, um, it becomes a rather circular effort. Um, bumping rights give people with more seniority. So the more expensive people, mm -hmm. the opportunity to bump out junior, less expensive people. Um, state regulatory requirements are maybe as simply explained as saying, 
um, you know, there's staffing ratios for, for certain uh, service areas like uh, the ICU um, that may have a two to one or three to one staffing ratio that you have to maintain if you have a licensed bed. Um, so, so there's, there's a lot of areas, um, regulatory and labor, a lot of limitations on how you can handle the nursing. And we'll talk about doctors um, in a minute, but uh, how, how did you go about reducing the nursing costs and rationalizing the nursing workforce in Verity? The first thing we did was we attacked it not through a reduction in force, um, uh, although we did end up doing some reduction in force, and we did it after filing for bankruptcy in part because it limited our severance obligations under the collective bargaining agreements. Um, but we did it through scheduling. We, 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 we really um, worked with each of the department heads. And so we got some buy-in from the nurses to reschedule the departments so that um, we really only had the bare necessities on where we needed the staffing to be. Uh, and we got an immediate 10% pop on our labor productivity just by being very thoughtful. Now it's a complicated analysis, um, but we got an immediate 10% pop on labor just from um, being um, very uh, attentive to how we scheduled. For ho hospitals now, um, after and, and still during the COVID um, situation and pandemic, how has that affected staffing issues at hospitals and how has that um, um, reflected in your, your plans for these distressed hospitals? Um, well, so I'll just say, look, pre-COVID, there was always staffing issues, kind of a tale of two worlds. There was the urban versus the rural. Um, rurals always had a harder time attracting staffing. Their turnover tends to be lower. Urban has um, less challenges in attracting staffing. Their turnover is much higher. Um, in COVID, that has been exacerbated materially. In fact, staffing, um, not just in acute care hospitals, but in skilled nursing and, and other providers as well, is, is one of the single biggest operating issues facing our clients. Um, we uh, had um, the benefit of having excess staffing that we could draw upon at the initial stages of COVID. And then we really had to reach out of state and, and, and grab travelers. And we were quick to grab travelers. We overcommitted to travelers to make sure we had the requisite capacity um, to ensure we could uh, maintain our, our hospitals, particularly our acute care beds. Um, and there is a real cost to it. Um, but, you know, is, is, Tanya can tell you in detail, one of the things we did at the same time was were very aggressive in negotiating for supplemental um, uh, funding from other sources, state sources mostly, to assist in underwriting that um, incremental staffing need associated with COVID. Now, now what about other expenses, uh, back office expenses, IT, that kind of thing? Did you, was that a, an area of focus that, that seems more similar to other cases, but um, how did you handle those reductions? Yeah, no, that's a great point. And, and, and back office is the, the, the easier place. Um, there's uh, less regulatory and CBA restrictions, right? Um, and there's the obvious target areas you hit on it. IT is a huge one. Um, there's the, um, the areas that are, I'll call non-core, given what we're doing, you know, we're in a sale process, an expedited sale process. So um, things like uh, strategy, um, uh, FP&A, um, uh, one thing we do, in fact, with all our clients, this goes beyond just Verity, uh, our, our health systems is duplicative executives, where you have multiple CEOs, CFOs, at every single hospital, um, we rationalize those. So did Verity, um, was that a situation at Verity? Did they have, my, my recollection was they had five or six different hospitals. Did they have duplicative executives? Yeah, they had executives. They had a, a duplicate executive team at every hospital. 
Mm. So what, what about uh, mo- moving on to a sort of different kind of, of ways to extend the runway? What about liquidity and cash management? Yeah. And then there's, there's look, the, the, everything that I say should be taken into the context of, um, I always tell my clients, uh, hospitals are um, extremely sensitive ecosystems. Everything you do has to be taken into that context. And so um, the kind of treasury discipline that you would, anyone in my position, right, a, uh, uh, a restructuring advisor would undertake in a client has to be done with the recognition that um, you cannot have a negative impact on the delivery of care. And so while um, the kind of treasury discipline you would do, stretching vendors, all vendors a little, some vendors a lot, um, you really need to do that um, by understanding that uh, you can't negatively impact your drug supply, for instance. Um, you really, um, in, in fact, there's some opportunities here. You, you have an opportunity to rationalize um, your number of vendors and, um, you know, the holy grail in, in, uh, in supply chain in hospitals is standardization, right? And you have an opportunity here to, um, to try and implement some standardization. Maybe you don't get to the holy grail, but you at least fast lane that process because you only have so much money, you can only spread that money so far with your vendors. And so you're going to pick winners and losers. And one of the ways to pick winners is not to have 12 orthopedic suppliers, uh, but to have two or three. It's, it sounds to me like these hospital situations, in many cases, you have really unique efficiency challenges um, going from a, an entity that hasn't really been paying as much attention as it should to these kind of issues to having to suddenly really ramp up um, this kind of management task. Yeah. And look, especially in nonprofit hospitals, right? Their, their primary focus is the quality of care. Um, and while they report financials and um, they're, you know, very sophisticated in managing their lenders, their capital structure, um, the fact of the matter is, is they just don't approach it the same way a for-profit hospital would, uh, with good reason. Um, and so, <laughs> they're, the, the, they're the, not supposed to make profit, <laughs> right? And so, the good news is, is that there's a lot of opportunities. the The challenge is, is you know, like I always say, you need to start with the initial premise. This is a very sensitive ecosystem, so you need to recognize that it's not as simple as saying we shouldn't have an oncology group, right? Um, because you need to understand all the things that feed off of that. And um, if you are not careful about understanding the relationships between all of your physicians and all of your service areas, you can create damage to um, your hospital Mm -hmm. and undermine its value, or in the worst case, create a liability for having done something that caused patient harm. Now you met, you mentioned a section a second ago financial reporting and that these companies were often experienced at financial reporting. Um, what modifications to those systems did you make or, or, or do you generally make in these situations and in Verity um, to, to reflect the distress situation and to prepare the company for a sale? The, um, the one thing that, that I've found almost across the board, particularly with nonprofit hospitals is they aren't very good at telling the story. And so there is an awful lot of noise in their financials and um, you need to be able to um, tell the story of the hospital of where it makes money. Um, This is reassuring, frankly, during your, your dip financing process as well. Um, but there are, uh, there's a lot of things that flow through, for instance, um, anything related to restructuring efforts and one-time efforts, you really need to be able to isolate. Um, things that are timing related, um, quaff or um, um, disproportionate care or quality-based um, uh, programs tend to have um, significant differences between costs paid in and receipts paid out. Uh, and so you need mm-hmm. to balance the timing of those so people really appreciate what the, 
the sort of ordinary course run rate of earnings is in that instance. So, so you and and just one last thing on on the runway. You mentioned a second ago um, eliminating uh, non core or unprofitable business areas, um, and you also mentioned that sometimes you can't reduce nursing staffing or, or reduce service under. Um, under regulatory regimes. So how, how do you balance those out? How, how do, you, do you shut down um, non-core businesses and operations um, in this environment where you have strict limits on what you can and can't do? Well, first of all, you attack the things that don't have a regulatory impact first. Um, uh, a lot of hospital systems I've worked with have um, health and wellness centers, um, underperforming clinics, you know, they have these cost centers that are nice to have um, and maybe serve a larger community health benefit, um, but they don't serve the underlying um, value of the business well. And those are things that you can turn off immediately. And they have an immediate impact, not just on your liquidity, but on your value proposition to potential buyers. You do a lot of the dirty work that they wouldn't then have to do. Mm-hmm. Um, but then you can also attack your portfolio of services. Um, and, and you I, should look at your portfolio of services. Sorry, go ahead, Tanya. Oh, sorry, Peter. Yeah, I was going to mention too, Kevin, in terms of your question, taking a step back, you know, we're talking about limiting nurses and we're talking about the regulatory issues and the mm-hmm. compliance issues that come up, right? But if you take a step back, and we even think of Verity as an example, there are other ways to achieve significant reduction of cost, right? So we think about the bankruptcy code and we think about the ability to reject agreements. And in the beginning of the case, there was a management services agreement that was in the tune of tens of millions of dollars. And when we sat down with BRG, when we sat down with the CEO, we talked about rejecting that agreement and what does it really cost to have these executives managing the system under the Verity umbrella instead of the other management system. And we were able to reject that management agreement and save millions and millions by really just bringing the executives under the the Verity umbrella. And so, you know, I think that yes, we reduce labor costs, but there's always always the reality that at the hospitals, you're gonna have to have certain nurses, certain doctors. I mean, that's critical to maintaining the value, but creatively you can use the tools in the code to cut costs by rejecting, for example, when we did the management agreement. Yeah, that, well, that's, that's, an, that's an excellent transition, Tanya. Um, to talking about the bankruptcy issues. But before you go further, let me just add the the standard disclaimer that the cases are still pending. Um, There are some litigations that are ongoing and appeals as well. So um, what we're talking about here today is educational, and we're not going to get into um, too much the sort of background on this because uh, the cases are still pending. But um, we'll talk as much as we can. I'm sorry, I interrupted someone who was jumping in there. I assume it's Mark. Yeah, it is me. Um, so, so look, t- t- to put a greater context on what Tanya said, this, this was a non-for-profit organization, but it had a management contract that was very healthy, run by a private enterprise and private investors. And so they're trying to get a return on the management agreement, de facto equity. So there's a lot of, I don't want to say fluff, but a lot of excess cost built into the management agreement. The other side is contending that the rejection damages exceeded $180 million. I mean, that's what what Tanya and her team were able to shed. On the COVID issue that Peter answered, it was a very mixed blessing, not only to create staffing and medicine, but for a while it cut off the beds, right? There was no elective surgeries being done in California. So you had a very big unexpected hit to revenue at a time we were already losing a lot of money. You know, the good news, bad news is at the beginning of the pandemic, California wasn't hit so bad, So we had a lot of empty beds. And so uh, Jim and Peter and Tanya and Sam Maisel was listening in, negotiated with the state a per bed charge with a certain number of minimum beds that we would hold available for the state and COVID patients. In certain facilities, um, it was easier to do that because we didn't have as many elective surgeries. 
The last part, and, and, and this is really important, um, and Peter points this out all the time, we're dealing with patient lives, right? It's We can't make a mistake. We can't run the risk of not having the right color sneakers or enough of extra large shirts. We have to have enough beds and medicines and, and medical care. And that becomes very, very challenging. And then you get into the last issue is the community aspect of it. So well, Peter said you could close down clinics, I assure you, it wasn't that easy. You had communities and, and town elders and politicians very involved. And then we operate, especially in California, but it's not unique to California, under a regulatory system that says as a condition to your operating license, you have to provide the following services at a minimum. And so that definitely hampered the ability of the debtor and the credit teams to maximize value in a, a completely optimal way. Last point there, and again, with your caveat, this is for educational purposes. The focus of people in Sacramento is very different than people are trying to account for bottom line, right? It is socially desirable to have neonatal oncology emergency rooms, but those are not always cost effective. And so when Jim went to sell the assets, Peter went to manage the cost, and Tanya and Sam went to court to, to justify all this, we always had those competing concerns. And you mentioned it's it's an interesting point. You, there seems to be a lot of of mention of, of essential services, whether required from a regulatory standpoint or because that's what hospitals and doctors do. They take care of critically ill patients, especially these kind of of large uh, not for not for profit systems. Um, how do you and and Tanya mentioned rejecting contracts, and I think this where this may be where this sort of feeds into the code. How do you balance those essential services and the, and the contracts and vendor relationships and labor relationships that are needed to provide those services with uh, services that are more profitable for the hospital um, that, you know, you, you need to have those services available or you're, you will have to shut down, can't get a sale done, and you won't be able to provide the essential services such as, um, you know, elective surgeries, that kind of thing. I mean, when you, when you were in there, Tanya, how did you and the, and the team and Peter handle picking among the essential vendors and the contracts that would be assumed with this conflict in mind? Well, as to the last aspect, Kevin, of your question, that was a very comprehensive process that we went through in the beginning of the case, right? I mean, choosing among vendors, figuring out what supplies you know you have to have, I think in my mind brings up kind of the critical vendor process that we went through. And to Mark's point, you know, we're not selling shoes, we are saving lives, right? And so we had a lot more leverage with the bankruptcy court in terms of the amount of money that we would get for the critical vendor pool, but then figuring out who, who is gonna be on that list. I mean, I will tell you, and I should probably turn it over to Peter, Peter spent weeks and weeks with, you know, all of the different teams at the six different hospitals to try to get the list down to something that was manageable. I think when we started, Peter, I mean, I think that everybody at Verity said, okay, let's do these 10,000 contracts or something astronomical, right? And I don't, there's not an easy answer to that because um, it, it's a cumbersome process. And Peter, do you want to speak to that a little bit? Because really you spearheaded mm -hmm. that with Rich and everybody else. I mean, look, there's there's definitely opportunities here. Um, a, a lot of these, particularly non-for-profit hospitals, have very long lifespans, right? So they've accumulated all of these vendors over the years. So this is an opportunity to rationalize that. Um, we, we obviously started with the things that were critical to care. Um, and we identified those vendors that were essential to care. Drugs is always the obvious answer, right? Um, we, we were going to do everything we could to make sure Cardinal's distribution was, was uninterrupted. Um, and then you move on to things that are less critical and you take advantage of, and you lay out all of your vendors by what they, they supply. And in some cases we, we, um, took advantage of the opportunity to rationalize vendors across the system that had never been done before, right? So they have six hospitals. Each hospital had their own vendor relationships. So now we have an opportunity to rationalize that and have one vendor for six hospitals. And now I'm suddenly getting much better rates on that vendor 
I have a healthier relationship with that vendor. Um, and I'm not having to pay six people critical vendor payments. Yeah, all right. Well, t- well, speaking of vendors, let's talk about the doctors. Um, it's my understanding that the doctors are generally independent contractors. Um, Peter, how does this dynamic work in these cases and dealing with these groups of doctors and trying to keep the right ones happy until you can get the hospital sold? Yeah, it's look, um, if, if this was a longer term engagement, you would do a, a true referral analysis on all the doctors and understand who, um, you, you know, are essential doctors. But in this case, you know, what we knew right away was um, that there were um, physician relationships where the physicians weren't even bringing any patients. So they weren't even operating at our hospitals. Um, and so we knew there was some rationalization opportunity there. The other big sort of obvious opportunity, look, the, um, the, the old adage, no doctor, no hospital is very true. So the hospital is just a hotel. Uh, the only way to fill that hotel is to have doctors bringing patients into the hospital, that and having an ER. Uh, and so, you know, you have and to- And nurses, Nur- nurses are critically important. Right. But to, from filling the hotel's perspective, thank you, Mark, <laughs> and, and the CNA, if they're listening. Uh, uh, but you, you, one of the things that we did find is, look, over the course of time, there was 125 different medical directorships, for instance, at the hospitals. You do have regulatory requirements for certain medical directorships, but that was like 60. And so immediately we could rationalize the number of medical directorships and um, save ourselves, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a month. And, and by directorships, you mean doctors who are heads of a particular group of practice? Correct. Right. And Kevin, I'll just um, add, you, you asked about, you know, the services that you provide and rationalizing the profitable from the unprofitable ones. I mean, look at the doctors know which of the things that they do make money for the hospitals, and they know that really well. And they all almost every physician has privileges to practice at other hospitals. And so, you know, you you have to pay attention to what the doctors want, because if they start referring all of their lucrative surgeries to the, you know, hospital across the street and leave unprofitable medical cases in your hospital, it has a big financial impact. And so, you know, there's, there's an assessment about how you manage this stuff from sort of an, you know, financial analysis you also have to think about what are the what are the how do you keep the support of the physicians? And I think I think in this case, the leadership team did a really good job of of keeping most of the right doctors engaged and um, and supportive for the long run of keeping that hospital healthy so it would be successful once we got to the conclusion of the case. Yeah, well, it's, it, I remember in my own experience, I, I represented some would be critical vendors as. Tanya might remember from a number of extremely annoying squeaky wheel emails. Um, And one of them made a machine that uh, performed hip hip transplant or uh, hip replacements. And the doctors were, uh, and and we were trying to be named as an essential vendor. And there were doctors that were getting phone calls from patients that wanted to play golf in a couple of weeks that needed to get their replacement done. And then those doctors were putting pressure on the hospital. So it's, it is an incredibly uh, complex uh, chain of causation when it comes to what's essential and what's not in these hospitals. Well, Tanya, back going back to you, we you mentioned let's talk about the contracts rejection and and the renegotiation process. You mentioned the management contracts. What what other kinds of unique executory contracts um, exist in these situations? Well, if you're DHCS, the state, you think that your Medi-Cal provider agreement is an executory contract that entitles you to cure costs, right? And so Medi-Cal took the position in Verity that any assumption and transfer of their agreement, you know, would require payment of cure costs. And, you know, that's what would happen outside of bankruptcy, right? You would have to pay all of those liabilities we were able to get a ruling from the bankruptcy court that basically held that those weren't executory contracts. Those provider agreements were licenses. And in essence, that meant that we could assume and transfer 
those agreements without having to pay the care costs, right? And in terms of being in a Chapter 11 case where liquidity is uh, constrained, that was really important, right? Another important aspect of that is outside of bankruptcy, if you were trying to sell Verity, which really couldn't have happened without a bankruptcy, you wouldn't have been able to transfer those agreements without successful liability. Another great tool in bankruptcy is that you are able to transfer those agreements without the sex or liability. And so in terms of unlocking value, when you focus on the provider agreements, you really see the benefits of doing a sell and dealing with these agreements inside of a bankruptcy case versus outside of a bankruptcy case. And, so, and what, what about collective bargaining agreements? Collective bargaining agreements are interesting, right? I mean, with Verity, that was one of really some of the most burdensome agreements on the system. And inside of the Chapter 11 process, you're obviously able to utilize the bankruptcy code to reject those agreements. There's obviously special provisions under 1113 compared to 365. But really what's important is that a cell of the hospital brings you to the table with the unions and gives you an opportunity to have negotiations about these collective bargaining agreements and about how there can be concessions made so that, you know, they could be modified and a buyer that's not willing to take them as no buyers are willing to take them as is could end up with an agreement that's more favorable. And it's really a great forum to be able to have those negotiations with the unions. To Mark's point, what's more important than nurses during a pandemic and figuring out how to try to make them happy and how to use the process to also be able to modify some of these agreements is critical to unlocking value and to having a buyer be in a position where, you know, it wants to either assume these agreements or the debtor will ultimately need to reject them, um, you know, through the process. So, so, so we've got, we, we've got, uh, oh, Kevin, oh sorry. I, yeah, if I may pipe in. What Tanya said is all true, but it, it's actually incredibly complex in the context of partially regulated businesses. In California, the unions have a disproportionate amount of power. And in a, in a committee that's made up of unions, doctors, trade vendors, and tort claimants, and the PBGC, you have a lot of disparate interests. So if you went to the attorney general and said, here's how we're going to downsize, they point to regulations under which we operated, promulgated by the then senator, now vice president-elect, right? So it becomes a very political issue. The unions don't want to attack politicians in Sacramento. The politicians in Sacramento want to protect their voter base, the unions. Um, there are not one union. There are four nurses unions, all at different hospitals. And then there are other unions. And so that dynamic, while the legal principle is simple enough under 1113, the, uh, to Peter's point, how this is all related and, and interwoven matters greatly. And that's really critically important to understand. So, so you have this sort of Gordian knot um, facing the bankruptcy. You have um, uh, staffing issues with nurses and, and perhaps declining volume. You have cash management issues and, and money going out the, out the window for wire transfers and other sort of unnecessary expenses. You have um, doctors that need to be pleased at the same time some of them aren't needed or necessary. And you have vendors who you need to provide uh, essential services such as drugs, but other vendors who you need um, who provide more profitable sorts of services. And then you have these, you have a, often a, a legacy management agreement that is above market. You have labor agreements that are difficult to deal with both in a legal and a, uh, a political sense and then you have government claims and provider agreement issues. And you, you get into bankruptcy and you've got Peter working on reducing the, the, the legacy vendor count and, and addressing the financial reporting and the staffing issues. You have Tanya getting contracts um, assumed and rejected and litigating with the, the state over payment of its claims and getting rid of, of or negotiating CBAs with the threat of getting rid of them. Um, 
let's move over to Jim now in, in terms of the marketing process. You've been handed a, a set of solutions um, for these very difficult problems or at least partial solutions. How do you go about the process of, of taking it the last mile and getting a buyer who is willing to close on an acquisition of, of one of these hospital systems? Well, um, you know, it, it's, all, uh, it's all a function of landscape. And so Peter talked about extending the runway, but the runway was not flat. It was really lumpy. And there were periods of time when we'd get big payments. And there were, you know, Tanya talked about the, the sort of monthly, um, the daily, you know, loss that the system was incurring, but it wasn't, you know, every day. There were these very lumpy payments that came in. So one of the things that we quickly did is looked for were whether there were opportunities to get certain of the sales done more quickly. And what emerged was um, a buyer in the county of Santa Clara that was very interested in two of the hospitals and that we could get that transaction closed more quickly. So we put a lot of emphasis on and the early um, early entering of the contract and getting a, a stocking horse bid from Santa Clara County and then pushing that to a, a fast close. And, and we got that transaction done pretty quickly, um, largely because public buyers like counties are not subject to the AG review process. And so that bypasses that whole regulatory review or a really important piece of the regulatory review piece. So we you know, typically a not-for-profit hospital sale is a 12 to 18 month process. Uh, we got we got hired um, in right around the 1st of July. Um, we, and we were able to get that Santa Clara transaction closed by the end of February, which is very, very fast. Um, and that was, that was really helpful to, um, on a lot of um, levels, but it helped from a liquidity perspective for, for Verity. It also helped give credibility to the creditors that there were there were solutions here, and um, and I think the Denton's team did a phenomenal job of you know getting that transaction from kind of handshake on business terms to closed in a very very fast period in a pretty difficult um, regulatory landscape. The other thing that we did is you know kind of stratified buyers by. Um, types of buyers. So there's strategic buyers, big not-for-profit health systems. They required a very different path of communication and, and, and process to, to, to develop, to determine whether they would have interest versus the more opportunistic um, buyers like, say, Prime Health as an example, who acquired uh, St. Francis, which was the biggest hospital. Um, the first thing we did is we got a quality of earnings study because, you know, I think Peter and, and Tanya and Mark have talked about the complexity of the financial history of Verity and the quality of earnings study sort of unpacked all that to make it much easier to understand what was really happening at each hospital level. And so giving that clarity to buyers about what, what was really going on there was, was very important. The next thing we did is put a really tight book together. It was a, you know, a, a very concise book that really captured what buyers needed to understand about what would make these hospitals work and be successful in the future. And that was our primary communication tool because we talked to a lot of buyers. I think we contacted more than 500 potential investors over the course of the process. Um, and so you needed to have really good marketing materials and communication materials with that group. Well, and then let, let, let me ask you a question, just jumping in real quick. Of those 500 buyers, um, you mentioned the different kind of buyers, but how many were, were focused strategic? How many were sophisticated, distressed? And, and how many were the sort of new, equi new uh, money equity bucket? You know, there were probably, uh, it, there was a reasonably long list for us of strategics, you know, probably 30 or so that we talked to. Which, which is a pretty long list in the state of California. There's not a lot of, uh, it's not an in, enormous interest in hospitals getting into the state of California, given some of the regulatory constructs that exist. Um, and many of those were fairly quick no's, but several of them involved pretty extensive conversations. Um, there's a large list of, um, of for-profit buyers that, were, that had interest in some, um, of the assets, you know, some, you know, varying combinations. And so that was another piece is really we had, we, once we got Santa Clara done, we had really 
three different processes that we were going that we had to manage. Um, there, there are two hospitals that are closely connected in, in Northern California and then two very different hospitals in LA. Um, and so, so that there were different investors that were interested in different of those um, assets. And we looked at, you know, alternate uses too. Um, we looked at real estate uses in, in uh, for both the Northern California and the, and the uh, St. Vincent Hospital in LA. And we, so we had to have multiple marketing processes going in sort of parallel with very different types of communication with those different buyers. Cause you know, the real estate guys were looking at it from one perspective, the hospital operators were looking at it from a different perspective. And the, and there were also a number of organizations that were thinking about converting hospitals or at least some of the hospitals to other uses like post-acute or behavioral care. And, um, and it, you know, it just took a big team and a lot of, co- a lot of discussion and then a rigid timeline of keeping people sort of feet to the fire in terms of getting indications of interest and letters of intent. So we really could sort out who we wanted to identify as the stocking horse bidders for each of the assets. Well, let me bring up a separate issue. Maybe this goes back to you, Tanya, and this may be for Jim, but you both mentioned uh, California Attorney General approval um, and that the transfer would or might have involved some kind of, of approval by the California AG. Can you elaborate on exactly, I know that was a big fight in the case. Um, how did you approach that and how did, how did you deal, Tanya, how did you approach that from a bankruptcy standpoint? And Jim, how did you approach that in terms of dealing with potential buyers? Sure, so from a bankruptcy standpoint, we know that to sell nonprofits, you also have to comply with state law. So we always knew that we were going to go get a sell order and that as quickly as we could after obtaining the sell order, we were going to submit an application to the attorney general. And the attorney general, we wanted the attorney general to consent to the sell. It doesn't have to consent to the sell, it can consent to the sell and also have conditions on the sale. And we always knew that that was going to be a cumbersome process. The application is thousands and thousands of pages and asks, you know, about the history, asks about the transaction, asks about other buyers. It's all under state law, but uh, it's a cumbersome process. You know, it was 95 days plus 45 days. So we're looking at a four month process. And so really is different from any garden variety chapter 11 case because we don't get our sell order and then we're done, right? the most complicated part comes after getting the sale order. And we anticipated that there would be conditions on the sale. I don't think it's a secret. And you mentioned, you know, about the fight that oftentimes the attorney general issues conditions that really are not concerned with the economics of the hospital. A lot of the conditions makes it very difficult for the hospitals to operate at a profit. I mean, they're regulating the number of beds. There's a lot of constraints on the hospitals with these conditions. And so what we had to do is we had to negotiate an agreement that anticipated that the attorney general would impose conditions that the buyer might not like. And the buyer might walk because those conditions would amount to millions of dollars that the buyer didn't want to deal with. And so the idea and what we did, and you know, I think that we'll see this in a lot of cases, and we've seen it in some cases, is that the asset purchase agreement provides for what happens in the event that the attorney general issues conditions different than the buyer wants to deal with. And what we did is we said we would have an opportunity to talk with the attorney general if that didn't prove fruitful. If we weren't able to convince the attorney general, we'd go to the court and we'd use the code 363 to cut off the additional conditions that really were tantamount to successful liability. And that is what we did. Unfortunately, all of our persuasive skills when it came to negotiating with the attorney general didn't work. And we had to go get the orders cutting off the conditions. As soon as the court entered the memorandum, for example, in one of the sales, we heard from the attorney general's office. They didn't want that precedent. So we reached an agreement to vacate the memorandum and they agreed to the conditions. And so there's a lot of negotiating that went on, but the real negotiating and the real agreement, unfortunately, didn't happen until we obtained the order. But, you know, the victories are really important to future sales, I think, inside and outside of bankruptcy. 
and knowing that there are some limits to what the attorney general can do in connection with these sales. And even to Jim's point, when we sold the hospitals to the county, the statute was clear as day that they didn't review that sale, but they disagreed and we had to get an order. And so I think there's a lot of helpful precedent now going forward for these kinds of sales. And I think maybe Jim, you wanted to add probably something. Well, to yeah, add. I think, um, yeah, fortunately, Tanya and, and Sam Maisel's persuasive um, arguments did work with the court, uh, which was helpful. But, um, but I think um, to the point about how it influenced our process, you know, there were a lot of things that were different about our process than just what are the what's the purchase price and, and what's the structure of the deal. We also had to get clarity from each of the bidders around how they wanted to deal with collective bargaining agreements and what kind of AG conditions would they accept and what they wouldn't accept. So there's all those, um, you know, we had to contemplate all those hurdles that would be covered, you know, once we had a contract had to get clarified through the process. And I think working really closely with, with the BRG folks, with the leadership team at Verity and with Denton's to make sure we understood what those were and could be communicated clearly. So we had really good documentation with the buyers about what they would live with and what they wouldn't live with. And I think that helped make the case with, with, at the, with the bankruptcy court about the question of AG review. But I mean, the bigger issue with the AG piece was just the uncertainty in the time. And that, you know, that it's such a long review process. And in the state of California, the AG doesn't just get to say, we approve it or not. As Tanya said, they can hang Christmas, you know, ornaments on it and say, we want this and we want this and we want this. The attorney general does have an important regulatory responsibility, but it's a political entity. And as Mark indicated, it has constituents that are really important to it. And a lot of those Christmas ornaments look like things that would be attractive to some of those constituents. And so that's all part of the effort that you've got to just have a disciplined process to set the stage for being able to get where you need to get. In, in Jim, each Jim I, I hate to cut you off, but we have to move on. We've run out of time. It's been a fascinating discussion. Sounds like um, there, this is one of the more complex areas for distressed professionals to have to maximize value and manage a sale process and a little bit like uh, building the airplane while you fly it, as they say, um, especially with regulatory requirements. Um, let, uh, let, let me add, we're going to move on now to uh, the next session, and that is honoring the 2019 turnarounds and workouts, outstanding young restructuring lawyers. Um, I'm going to hand this over now and thanks for attending and thanks to Jim, Mark, Tanya, and Peter for, uh, for participating. and I'm delighted this afternoon to be presenting Turnarounds and Workouts Awards for the Outstanding Young Restructuring Lawyers of 2020. Every year, Turnarounds and Workouts selects the bankruptcy lawyers under 40 who have most moved the field forward in the preceding year. This year's honorees represent a cross-section of bankruptcy practice. Rachel Ringer, Eric Stadola, and Jonathan Canfield are being recognized for their representation of official committees and ad hoc groups. Darren Asman is being recognized for his development of significant clients internationally. Erica Weisgerber is being recognized for litigation and her representation of investment banks. Michelle Maman, who is an honoree for the second time, is being recognized for notable representation in the senior lender area, as is Gabriel Morgan. Gabriel, as well as Greg Fox, have also had significant debtor side representations during the past year. Some of the honorees are new partners or relatively young in the field, including Angela Libby, Joseph Larkin, and Daniel Foreman. 
Others are established bankruptcy practitioners, such as Jennifer Marines, who is the co-chair of Morrison and Forrester's Global Bankruptcy Group, as well as, as its Global Finance Group. Jennifer is receiving this award for the fifth time, which is an all-time turnarounds and workouts record. Jonathan Canfield is receiving this award for the fourth time, which is also a turnarounds and workouts record. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce 2020's Outstanding Young Restructuring Lawyers. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Uh, I'm honored to be recognized as an Outstanding Young Restructuring Lawyer this year. Uh, turnarounds and Workouts is a phenomenal organization uh, that really provides a lot of value to restructuring professionals. Uh, and they've certainly been a critical part of my growth as a lawyer. So thank you very much. Hi, right, thanks, Stephanie. Um, look, I just, it, with so many deserving nominees, it's, it's a real honor to, again, be selected as one of the outstanding young restructuring attorneys for 2020. I mean, I also just want to give a special thanks to Turnaround and Workouts and both Colin and Stephanie personally. I know with the year we've all had, it's, it's, it's been very challenging on many fronts. And I think it's a real testament that um, to, to your hard work and dedication that the industry, again, will be able to benefit from the conference. It's, it's always a very informative and exciting time of the year. And, and although it's going to be virtually, again, it's a, it's a testament to your dedication that it's able to go forward in, in the format it is. So with that, again, thank you. And it's a real, real honor and a real pleasure. Thank you, Stephanie. And thank you to Turnarounds and Workouts for this prestigious recognition. I am truly honored to be mentioned in the same category as the other outstanding young restructuring lawyers receiving this award. When the announcement was made, the phone calls, emails, and LinkedIn messages alone demonstrated the wide reach Turnarounds and Workouts has in our fast growing and increasingly critical corner of the legal world. I'd like to thank the entire business reorganization and restructuring department at Wilkie for nominating me and for being my home since I graduated Georgetown Law School. I'd especially like to thank Rachel Strickland and Matt Feldman, who have given significant time and energy mentoring me from the very beginning. Finally, I must thank my family, especially my wife, Lindsay, for, the, for their unwavering support in helping me to build the fulfilling career I have to this point. I look forward to next year's event, where hopefully we'll all be able to gather and catch up in person. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, it is an honor. I, I truly appreciate the recognition by turnaround and workouts. I'm especially honored to be considered for this award uh, alongside the, the very deserving, um, my fellow deserving candidates. Um, I work with many of them uh, and um, it's truly an impressive class. Uh, I'd also like to thank all my colleagues at, at Goodwin Proctor um, for their support over the years. Um, uh, it's been a very interesting year for sure. I'm presently doing this in my, in my office here with my guitars and my neighbor using a chainsaw. So um, here's to a, a better 2021. And um, I look forward to seeing a lot of you in person in the, in the months to come and working on deals with you all for years to come. Thank you to Turnaround and Workouts for this honor. It is always an honor and a privilege to represent and work alongside members of this community and my colleagues at Davis Polk. And that is only more true in these unprecedented times. This year, the stakes certainly felt higher than ever, and the good outcomes felt more complex and harder earned than ever. And I'm ever more appreciative of the trust that investors and companies place in us as advisors. While I look forward to the day when we can force you all back into conference rooms to stare at each other until you all reach deals, in the meantime, I hope that everybody has a safe and healthy holiday season. Good afternoon and thank you. Uh, a big thank you to Turnarounds and Workouts for choosing me as a recipient for this award. It is truly an honor to be considered in the same class, uh, even if it is indeed a virtual class this year, with the other honorees receiving this award alongside me. My path has crossed with many of them throughout my career in this field, and it is truly an honor to share the stage. Um, in a year like 2020, and with all of its challenges, I truly feel even more grateful for my Cadwalder colleagues and my peers at the other firms alike, as well as for the good fortune I have of getting to do new and exciting work for clients every day, particularly in these trying times. So truly, thank you again um, to Turnarounds and Workouts for this recognition as a young restructuring lawyer, especially as I now transition out of the young category. 
I endeavor to continue to deliver my best for all of you each day and wholeheartedly appreciate your support. Congrats to all. Thanks again and cheers to a better 2021. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I just want to thank Turnaround and Workouts and the Beard Group for this distinguished award. I know that keeping things normal during a pandemic is not easy, and I really do appreciate the members' willingness to dedicate so much of their time to get to know the candidates, our practices, our achievements. And I also want to congratulate my fellow 2020 class. Some of us have been in the trenches together for years, and there are others of you who I know by reputation, of course, and who I very much look forward to working with in the future. And of course, an immense thank you to my firm, Morrison and Forrester, and my partners who have always, always supported my career, my development, my visibility in the firm and in the industry. And a specific shout out to the chair of our firm, Laren Nischelsky. Yes, this is number five, and no, I did not doctor my birth certificate. Thank you again to all of the restructuring community. Stay safe, stay sane, and have a wonderful holiday season. Thank you. Hi, and thank you, Stephanie. Um, this has been a crazy year for all of us personally and professionally. So, so first to everyone that's out there watching, I hope you, your families, your friends are all well, healthy and safe. And to Stephanie and to the turnarounds and workouts team, thank you for recognizing me as an outstanding young restructuring lawyer. I'm grateful for the recognition and the award. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie, um, and thank you to Turnarounds and Workouts for uh, what is an incredible honor. Um, very proud to be among the list of my fellow restructuring lawyers, uh, which is just a very impressive list, and um, I very much appreciate it. I uh, obviously want to thank my firm, Kramer Levin, um, and my partners and colleagues, associates, counsel, special counsel, um, who are all, you know, an integral part of our team at Kramer 11 and with whom I could not do my job. Uh, and I also want to thank um, the clients as well. Uh, you know, we've, we've been fortunate enough to have a number of wonderful opportunities um, over the past year and more. Uh, and we're very much looking to looking forward to uh, additional great opportunities in the future. Thank you to Turnaround and Workouts. It's an honor to be named one of 2020's Outstanding Young Restructuring Lawyers. It's been a challenging year, uh, but I'm glad that the restructuring community is still finding ways to connect, even if it's remotely. Uh, you know, I'm looking forward to a time when we can do events like these in person again. Uh, in the meantime, please feel free to continue to reach out. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy. Thanks again. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you to Turnaround and Workouts for this honor, and congratulations to the other honorees. I started out my career as a general commercial litigator, and the fact that I now identify as a bankruptcy litigator and a restructuring lawyer is testament to the very interesting work that you all do and to the Turnaround and Restructuring community at large, with whom I love working day in and day out. I've been fortunate enough to work on several challenging matters and have had wonderful clients and incredible mentors who have led the way both at Devavoys and within the broader industry. Thank you in particular to the restructuring team at Devavoys, past and present, as well as to my family. Uh, the restructuring community is truly a special group of professionals, and I look forward to working with you all for many years to come. Congratulations to all the honorees. On behalf of the entire restructuring community, let me extend my thanks for your contributions this year and my hopes for continued collaboration for many years to come.